Evolution of the web. The web we experience today is very different from what it was 10 years ago. How is the web evolving and, more importantly, where is it next? And why is any of these important? If history has taught us something, these changes are very important. In this video, I'll explain how the web has evolved, where to go next, and why it's important. Think about how the internet affects your daily life. Think about how society has changed as a result of the internet. Social media platform. Mobile app. And now, the internet is undergoing another paradigm shift. Web evolution. The web has evolved significantly over the years, and today's applications are barely recognizable from the early days. The evolution of the internet is often divided into three phases, Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. What is Web 1? Web 1 was the first iteration of the web. Most of the participants were consumers of the content, and the creators were usually the developers who created the website containing the information provided primarily in text or image format. Web 1 lasted from about 1991 to 2004. Web 1 consisted of websites that provided static content rather than dynamic HTML. The data and content was provided by a static file system rather than a database, and the website wasn't very interactive. You can think of Web 1 as a read-only web. What is Web 2? Most of us are primarily experiencing the web in its current form, commonly referred to as Web 2. You can think of Web 2 as an interactive and social web. In the Web 2 world, you don't have to be a developer to participate in the build process. Many apps are built to be easy for anyone to create. If you have an idea and want to share it with the world, you can. If you want to upload a video and have millions of people watch it, interact with it, and comment on it, that's possible. Web 2 is really simple, and because of its simplicity, more and more people around the world are becoming creators. The current web is very good in many ways, but there are some areas that can be further improved. Web 2.0 Monetization and Security In the Web 2 world, many popular apps follow a common pattern in their life cycle. Think about some of the apps you use every day and how the following examples apply to them. Monetization of the app Imagine the beginnings of popular applications such as Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube and how they differ today. The process typically looks like this. Company launches app. Consolidate as many users as possible. Then monetize your user base. When developers and businesses release popular apps, the user experience often becomes very smooth as the app becomes more popular. That's why they can quickly build a foothold in the first place. Many software companies don't think about monetization at first. They have a strict focus on growth and new user acquisition, but in the end they need to start making profits. We also need to consider the role of external investors. In many cases, restrictions on the use of venture capital and the like negatively impact the life cycle and ultimately the user experience of many of the applications currently in use. When a company building an application raises venture capital, its investors often expect a return on investment in the order of tens or hundreds of their deposits. This means that instead of choosing a sustainable growth model that can be maintained in a more organic way, companies are often pushed down two paths, promoting or selling personal information. For many Web2 companies such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter, more data leads to more personalized advertising. This will increase your clicks and ultimately your advertising revenue. Leveraging and centralizing user data is at the heart of the way the web we know and use today is designed to work. Security and privacy. Data breaches are common in Web2 applications. Some websites address these breaches and let you know if your data has been compromised. In Web2, you can't control the data or how the data is stored. In fact, Companies often track and store user data without the consent of the user. 
All of this data is owned and managed by the company responsible for these platforms. Users living in countries that have to worry about the negative effects of freedom of expression are also at risk. Governments often shut down servers or confiscate bank accounts if they believe that a person is expressing an opinion that contradicts the publicity. Centralized servers make it easy for governments to intervene, control, or shut down applications at their sole discretion. Banks are also digitally centralized, so governments often intervene. They may block access to bank accounts or restrict access to funds during periods of volatility, extreme inflation, or other political turmoil. Web3 aims to address many of these shortcomings by fundamentally rethinking how to build and operate applications from scratch. What is Web3.0? There are some basic differences between Web2 and Web3, but the focus is on decentralization. Web3, as we know it today, adds some more features to the internet. Web3 is verifiable untrusted autonomy without permission decentralized and robust civic native integrated payment. In Web3, developers typically build and deploy applications that run on a single server or store data in a single database, usually hosted and managed by a single cloud provider. Instead, Web3 applications run on either blockchains, distributed networks of many peer-to-peer -peer nodes, servers, or a combination of both, forming crypto-economic protocols. These apps are often referred to as dApps, decentralized apps, and the term is displayed. To achieve a stable and secure decentralized network, network participants, developers, are motivated and compete to provide the highest quality service to everyone who uses the service. Cryptocurrencies are often part of a conversation when heard from Web3. This is because cryptocurrencies play a major role in many of these protocols. It provides financial incentives, tokens, to anyone who wants to be involved in creating, managing, supporting, or improving a project. These protocols often offer a variety of different services, including processing power, storage, bandwidth, identity, hosting, and other web services traditionally provided by cloud providers. People can make a living by participating in the protocol in various ways, in both technical and non-technical levels. Consumers of the service usually pay to use the protocol, similarly to how they would pay a cloud provider like AWS today. Except in Web3, the money goes directly to the network participants. In this, like in many forms of decentralization, you'll see that unnecessary and often inefficient intermediaries are cut out. Many web infrastructure protocols like Filicoin, Livepeer, Arweave, and The Graph, which is what I work with at Edge and Node, have issued utility tokens that govern how the protocol functions. These tokens also reward participants at many levels of the network. Even native blockchain protocols like Ethereum work this way. Local payment. Tokens also introduce a completely borderless and frictionless native payment layer. Companies like Stripe and PayPal have created billions of dollars in value by enabling e-commerce. These systems are too complex to achieve true international interoperability between participants. They also require you to hand over your sensitive information and personal data in order to use them. Crypto wallets like Metamask and Taurus enable you to integrate easy, anonymous, and secure international payments and transactions into Web3 applications. Networks like Solana offer several hundred-digit millisecond latency and transaction costs of a small fraction of a penny. Unlike the current financial system, users do not have to go through the traditional numerous, friction-filled steps to interact with and participate in the network. All they need to do is download or install a wallet, and they can start sending and receiving payments without any gatekeeping. A new way of building companies. Tokens also brings about the idea of tokenization and the realization of a token economy. Take, for example, the current state of building a software company. Someone comes up with an idea, but in order to start building they need money in order to support themselves. To get the money, they take on venture capital and give away a percentage of the company. This investment immediately introduces misaligned incentives that will, in the long run, not align well with building out the best user experience. Also, 
If the company ever does become successful, it will take a very long time for anyone involved to realize any of the value, often leading to years of work without any real return on investment. Imagine, instead, that a new and exciting project is announced that solves a real problem. Anyone can participate in building it or investing in it from day one. The company announces the release of X number of tokens and give 10% to the early builders, put 10% for sale to the public, and set the rest aside for future payment of contributors and funding of the project. Stakeholders can use their tokens to vote on changes to the future of the project, and the people who helped build the project can sell some of their holdings to make money after the tokens have been released. People who believe in the project can buy and hold property, and those who believe that the project is going in the wrong direction can signal it by selling their stock. All blockchain data is fully public and open, so buyers have complete transparency about what is happening. This is in contrast to buying stock in private or centralized companies, where much is often kept secret, 